Welcome to another video tutorial. In this video, we're going to take a look at the global event scripts. These are all of the events that can happen globally in your game. What we're going to do is we're going to go through every single one of the uh, events in this list. We're going to talk about what they are for, what the different um, bits of data you can get from each event, and an example of how you might use uh, these particular events. So let's start with the first one, which is camera direction changes. So what this event basically does is every time the camera changes direction, so every time you rotate the camera to face a new direction, the event will fire, will trigger. And if you have a script assigned to this event, then that script will do whatever it is you want it to do. So to demonstrate this, what we'll do is we'll go to the script editor, we'll, we'll create a new script, and we'll call this global script. And we'll use this throughout the whole of this video. We'll change this script and make it applicable to all of the events as we go through, starting with the camera um, event. So what we can do is we can get rid of the display message. And instead what we'll do is we'll bring in a log message and the log message can print camera dot direction and we actually don't want it to be in quotes so let me just get rid of the quotes like that so it should look like that so camera should be in yellow and then dot direction should be in orange so we're going to basically log message the direction of the camera. We'll quickly throw in a wait at, say, three seconds. And then we're going to have to type this because it isn't in the list at the moment. We'll quickly add in clear log. So that will then clear the camera direction off of the screen. So with this script saved, what we'll do is we'll go back to game configuration and we'll assign global script as the camera direction changes script. So when this event gets triggered, this is the script that's going to run. So we'll save that and let's launch into the game. So here we are in the game. So you can see that as I rotate the camera, it prints it over here, the camera direction. So we're now currently facing west. If I rotate back, now we're north. And that will disappear after three seconds. This would be east. It's going to disappear again. This would be south. Now, as you notice, camera direction, or sorry, the event, only fires when you're facing one of the four was called cardinal directions. In other words, north, south, east, west. It's not going to trigger facing, you know, southwest, for example, which is where I'm currently facing now. Notice how there isn't anything coming up on the screen. If I face southeast, again, it still doesn't trigger. I have to actually be facing one of these specific um, compass directions, north, south, east, and west, before it will actually trigger the event. So don't expect to be able to um, have the event fire in between north and east, for example. It, it will have to be one of the... Um, it has to be a major change from north to west or south to east, for example, before it will fire the event and do whatever it is you want to do. But as you can see, we can return, every time we do turn the camera, we can return the current direction of the camera using the camera dot direction um, variable. So what we can do with that is you could then have a script where whenever you change the camera, you can grab the direction that it's now facing and you can check if it's a particular direction. So you could say, after I've after you've turned the camera, is it now facing west? If it's facing west, then do something. Otherwise, do something else. So 
An example of that might be, if we go back to our script, I'm going to do it via the text just because it's a lot quicker. But if we were to say dollar direction, or well, let's just do dire equals camera dot direction, just so we've got a store of it. We don't really need to store it like this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then what we can do is we can say if dollar dire is equal to west, then we could have a log message. You are facing west. End. So now that will um, only show anything if we're facing west. So let's save this and run it again. So if we turn this way, we're facing east, so nothing happens. This is south, so nothing happens. Let's go back to east, go back to north. Now if we turn this way, you are facing west. So depending on what you want to have happen, depending on which direction the camera has been turned, you can obviously then, you know, have things happen. You could have... Um, walls get hidden for example you could make it so that if the camera is facing uh, this way then walls like this one for example which might be blocking the view you could hide um, and then as you're turning this way you could then bring this wall back and hide this wall and then if you turn this way you could bring this wall back and hide this wall so that's one thing you could do doing sort of cutaway walls depending on which uh, way the camera is facing um, that, that could be one use that's certainly one use I've done with um, spinning the camera around and using camera dot direction. So let's move on. That's camera um, the camera direction global event. It's pretty straightforward. It's just it's fired every time the camera direction changes, and you can reference the direction of the camera using the camera dot direction variable. Okay. So now let's go to player character levels up. So let's take uh, that script off and let's apply global scripts now to levels up and say OK. And then let's make a change to this script. So what I'm going to do is log message. In fact, let's bring that back. So. Leveling up. This event will fire every time you level up. Every time a player character levels up, this event will trigger and therefore whatever script is assigned to this event will fire. You can reference the player who leveled up using the inbuilt self variable. So this event, player character levels up, always returns self so any scripts you have assigned to this event can use the self variable to reference who was it that leveled up. So if we apply and save this, and uh, I'm just trying to think quickest way to do this. Let's go to stats quickly. And yeah, we'll do it this way. Let's see if we can cheat self a new level. Uh, I forgot to create a level, which does help. So the required XP, let's say, is 10. We've got a level 2. We'll leave everything as is. We just want to, for now, just see what happens when we level up. So our script, again, is going to log message self, wait for 3 seconds, and then clear the log. And this has been set on the global event player character levels up. Okay? So if we play the game, And if we print player.stat level, we can see we're currently level one. So let's do player.stat XP plus equals 10. 
So that will give us the 10 required XP needed to level up. We will level up, like so. But you can also see character-based Justin appeared in the top um, top left-hand side. And that's the self. That's the reference to who leveled up. So if you wanted a script to then do something to that particular entity, you can use the self on a level levels up script to reference the entity that leveled up. So it could be a party member or it could be your player character. If we now print the level again, we can see we're now level two. So that's the levels up global event. So let's now move to player is defeated and set this to global script. So an important thing to know about the player is defeated um, event is there are no um, variables that it gives off that we can use, but also more importantly, this only works with real time battles. This doesn't work with turn based or menu based battles. So this event will not be triggered if the player is defeated during a turn-based battle or a menu-based battle. Okay, and I can we'll show this off. So let's say, for example, this script can log message the player has just died. And then wait three seconds, clear the log, apply and save. Okay. So if we go to the map and we edit this goblin and make it so that he is attackable in real time and is hostile, then he should fight us. And if we allow him to kill us, then that event should trigger. The player has just died because that um, that event just triggered the player died. Okay, let's go back to the map and let's turn attackable in real time off and say when we interact, start battle, battle one, and save. So now this is going to be a turn based battle. If we just let everything kill us, notice how you don't get a log message in the top corner because that event doesn't get triggered by tactical turn based battles or menu driven battles. So if you want to use the player is defeated um, global event, it has to be done with real time battles. There is a way that you can kind of do it with turn-based battles. We'll get to that. Uh, I think it's coming up, but not yet. Or it might be, it might be next, actually. Let's have a look. Yes, character's health changes would be one way that you could do it in a tactical turn-based um, battle. So we'll set this to none now. And now let's take a look at the character's health changes event. We'll set this to global script. So, first of all, let's take a look at what this does. This basically gets triggered every time, as it suggests, character's health changes. So every time the health changes, whether it's positively or negatively, this event will fire. So whatever scripts you have inside this uh, event will be triggered. This event passes um, a couple of variables that we can use. So let's go to our script and take a look at those. So let's log message self, but we can also log message dollar amount. So the first one is the reference to whose health 
got changed. So, you know, if, for example, you hit an enemy, then it would be the enemy. Self would be a reference to the enemy. If you got hit, self would be a reference to you. And then uh, dollar amount would be the amount of health that was changed, either positively or negatively. Because don't forget, health changes could also be the result of you healing. Your health would change. So then this event would also fire in the event of a character healing as well, because the health would change. So in that case, self would be a reference to the person who healed, and dollar amount would be the amount of health that was changed by the, you know, when the health was changed. So let's um, apply and save this script. Make sure this is set on the health changes, and let's go into the game. So, you can see already straight away, when you start the game, it already showed a reference to self and the amount at the very beginning. Let me just quickly run that again, just so it's, you can see. As Soon as we start the game, you can see the reference to self and the amount. That's because, obviously, when the game runs, it considers a... When it adds the player, it obviously sees that as a health-changing event, even though the amount was zero. So um, that's worth noticing as well. Obviously, you wouldn't notice that if you do if you weren't logging the variables. Um, so let's quickly print player dot stat HP just to see what we're at health-wise. So we're currently at twenty health. So rather than uh, going into a battle just yet. Let's do it this way. Player.stat HP. Let's say we got damaged by 10 health. Okay, so take away 10 health. Okay, if we look up in the top here, you can see that the self was character based Justin because I said player.stat and then the um, um, dollar amount was negative 10. That's because it's taking away 10. So in this case, the amount also knows that it's a deductive amount rather than a positive amount. Let me show that again. If I put health back up, if I give myself 10 health, then you can see it's a 10. It doesn't show a plus, it just it just has positive and, min and, and negative numbers. So 10 would be a positive number, whereas if I took 10 away, negative 10 would be a deductive number, okay? So, let's put 10 health back up, okay? And let's go into a battle quickly. So, if I hit this goblin, then it shows, oh, shows a couple of things. I got hit by a couple of things there, so it kind of wiped away the goblin. Um, in fact, let me amend the script for a second. Let's take away the weight and clear so that we can see as much of this information as we can. This is so let's just see where we're at. So if I hit this goblin, so you can see that I hit the goblin and it took free health away from the goblin. And then if I end my turn, I'm going to get hit a load of times. So you'll see base Justin appear about three times probably because I'm going to get hit by that, that, and probably that as well. Okay, a couple of times. And you can see the first one took three away from me. The second one took four away. So you can see that, first of all, this is what the um, health changes event returns. It returns self and it returns the amount. So you can use both of those to find out who it was that was damaged and how much was taken away or given back. Um, and you can also see that in turn-based battles, it's still working. So you could, if you wanted a player dies type event in a turn-based battle, you could use a check for if self is the player, i.e. if the person taking the damage is the player, and if the amount is equal to the character's health, then it should trigger an on-death script. Does that make sense?
So, you could have something like if self equals player, then if uh, player or if self dot stat, actually, if dollar amount, sorry. Um, is equal to self dot stat. I guess the question is it's a negative amount, so you might have to get creative with it. But just to give you an idea, this is not necessarily something that's going to work, but it's just to give you a starting point for what you might do for a def script in a turn-based battle. So we're basically saying if self is the player, in other words, if the person getting hit is the player, and if the amount being returned as the damage is the same as the health of the player, then we can assume that that has now killed the player. So then, you know, display message or whatever it is you want to then do. So that would be an example of potentially a on-def script for the turn-based battles, even though this doesn't work in a turn-based battle, if that makes sense. So let's move on. That's character's health changes. So it's, it returns self and it returns the, the dollar amount. Let's now move on to character enters a tile. So I'm going to, um, just to speed things up, I'm going to refer to all three of these as kind of the same thing. Because in essence, what I really want to cover in this video is what each property, what each event does, but also more importantly, the variables it gives you that you can use. So in the case of the tiles one, enters, stops on, and exits, it's the same um, information. It's just whether you're entering the tile, stopping on the tile, or exiting it. It's going to be the, the same information, though. Okay, But just to be clear, these events, character enters tile, stops on a tile, exits a tile, these events get triggered every time the player either enters a tile, or stops on a tile, or exits a tile, irrespective of which tile it is. So this is, to be very clear, this is different to when you do it on a specific tile. So for example, if I was in the map editor, I could select this tile and I could say scripts when character enters tile, you know, do a script, right? And that means that only when I enter this tile will this script happen, okay? Let's... Um, Set that to none. Okay, so only when you enter this tile will that script happen. But this event in the global events, this uh, enters tile will happen on every tile. Every time a character enters a tile. And it's also going to be every character. So every time any character enters any tile, this event is going to happen. So if we, for example, put global script on there and take it off of... Um, the health and let's go to our script and let's just make a couple of changes so let's log message twice wait three seconds and clear log okay so character enters tile and exits tile and stops on tile, they all return two variables that you can use. The first one is self. And that's going to be a reference to the tile that you're on at the time, or sorry, not the time necessarily that you're on. It could be any character. It could be, you know, an enemy moves. But it's basically self is always a reference to the tile that was triggered in this particular event. Okay. And then the other one is initiator. And this is a reference to who was it that moved? Who was it that stepped on that tile? So self is the tile. Initiator is who's now on that tile. Okay, who triggered this script? So if we save this and to demonstrate this, let's go to the map. Let's select our goblin. I'm going to set him to movable all 
but let's make it so that his movement interval is fixed and he moves every six seconds, let's say. So he's not moving all the time. And let's test. So, as soon as the goblin moves, there we go. So we got the tile that he's now on, and also um, initiator was the goblin sword. We'll wait for him to move again, and we'll look in the top left again. There we go. So tile grass, character goblin sword. If I move, tile grass, character Justin, tile grass, goblin. If I step onto this one, for example, it's now a path, and it got white, hold on. Tile path, base Justin, yeah? So, and you can see it's happening no matter who's moving, and every time somebody moves, it's it's triggering um, the tile that you're on. If you want to return that, you can get the tile based off uh, self, and you can get the character that moved using the initiator, okay? If you want to refine it a bit, you can then obviously check for a particular tile, so if you don't want it to fire every single time or, or, it, or for it to do something every single time a character moves, um, we could, for example, let's, let's mess around with the script a bit. Let's say, um, so we've got self, which is a reference to the tile. So we could say if self is equal to... Um, Let's try this path. Let me just get the name of my... Why is path not on there? Perhaps it was path two. Could have sworn it was called path. If self equals path two, then log message. You are on the path. Okay, and let's also make it so that it ignores the goblin as well. So if self is equal to player, then do all of this. So we'll just quickly in jog that. Oops. And indent that. And. And. Oops. Okay, so we're basically saying if it's the player... And if, oh, sorry, no, that's not going to work. If initiator is the player, because initiator is the one that returns who triggered it. So who moved? So if who moved is the player. And if the tile they're on is path two, which I'm hoping will work. In other words, is it a model path two? Then show you're on the path. Let's see what happens. So now, even if I move or the goblin moves, we're not going to see anything appear on the screen because it should only happen if it's me moving and if I now step onto one of these dirt path tiles. Okay, so obviously, let me just see, print, um, self is path two. Can I do self.model? Would that work? That might work. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll quickly amend our script and we'll say if self.model equals path to. That's probably what it is. There you go. The reason it didn't do it there is that's not a path two tile, that's a path one tile. But now every time I step, every time I move, onto a tile that is type path two, we get the you are on the path. And it's doing it every time I move on the path, because I'm basically saying if it's me and if I'm standing on a model a tile that is the model and the goblin didn't trigger it because it has to be me that triggers it. It's not going to trigger it here because I'm now on a crossroads tile. But now I'm on it again. So Again, that's to give you an idea of how you can filter out by a particular character, filter out a particular tile. And this event, as I say, will fire every time any character moves onto any tile. 
And it's exactly the same whether it stops on a tile or exits a tile. It's the same two variables, self and initiator. Self is always the tile. Initiator is always who triggered it. The difference is it's whether you immediately enter a tile, whether you have to stop first, then it will fire, or whether it's when you leave a tile. That's the only difference, but it will always fire all the time. Okay, so that's enters tile. Next, we have character is damaged. This is very much like health changes, but this is more specifically, um, is a character losing health. So let's put the global script onto that and press OK. So I believe that damage will also work in a turn-based battle as well. We can check that, but let's change our code. So we can log message. Uh, I think it returns two. So let me just put both up on the screen. Again, I'm not going to hide these ones because obviously it's going to show two. So damage returns three things actually. So let's put three of them up. So the first one is self and that's a reference to who's taking the damage. So let's say for example a goblin hits the player. Self would be the player because they're, they're the one losing health. They're the character that took damage. So self is um, the person who took the damage. Initiator is a reference to who caused the damage. So if it was the goblin that hit the player, then initiator would be the goblin, okay? And then there's, an, there's a variable that you can also use, a local variable, dollar damage which returns the amount of damage that was caused, okay? How much damage did the goblin, for example, do to the player? So if we log those messages and see them on the screen, in a battle, so if I hit this goblin, for example, Self should be the goblin. So the first thing, we'll, we, this will happen quite quickly. So I'm going to show, I'm going to predict what will come up on the screen. So the first thing at the top should be the goblin. Underneath that should be base Justin, because that would be the initiator. That's That would be who's causing the damage, me, because I'm about to hit this goblin. And then the number underneath would be the damage. Yeah, so goblin sword hit by me. I took, I, I hit him for four damage, okay? If I was to now end my turn. So the last person to hit me was the red slime. It hit me, so self was me taking the damage. The initiator was the slime and he hit me for four damage. So I've just lost four um, health, but I also lost three from the goblin sword as well. So... If I had 20 health to begin with, I should have, you see if that's right, player.stat HP, I think I have 30 actually, 13, no that's probably right actually, 20 health, take away 7, 13, yeah, so, but you get the idea, so that's returning um, the, those three things that you get from the um, damage event. The self is the person taking the damage, who's losing the health. The initiator is who's causing the damage. And then the dollar damage is a reference to the number of how much in that particular instance was the damage. Okay, so again, you can use if statements to check those things. You can store them in properties. You can, you know, do whatever you want with them. But this is this is the sort of information you're getting back. Okay, so let's move on to the next event, which is object is grabbed. I'm also going to include object is released in the same um, section, but we'll come to pushed afterwards. So let's take off the global script and put it on object is grabbed. So this is when a pushable object, like a crate, for example, is grabbed. So when you grab onto it, this event would be fired. When you release the object, 
again, this object, this event would be fired. Um, object is grabbed and object is released. Uh, have two variables they pass when that event happens that you can use in scripts on that event. So let's go to our log, get rid of this, and it's these two. Self is a reference to the object being grabbed or released. Initiator is a reference to who is grabbing or releasing that object. So if we, um, let's go back to game configuration for a second and put the same script on released and play. So here I have a pushable object. So if I now grab that, so barrel and Justin. And if I release the object, which I believe is the G key, again, the barrel and Justin. So it's it's returning self as the object that you've grabbed and initiator is who's grabbed the object. Again, you can use if statements to, you know, check if it, if what, you know, what object have you grabbed or what object have you just released or who's grabbed it or who's released it. Or you can store that information into properties and, you know, have scripts do things based on that information doing, uh, during that event. Okay, so that's how that works. So I said that I would cover pushed separately and the reason for that is it does a little bit more when you're actually pushing an object. There's a little bit more we can use in a script on that event. So let's put our global script on that. So this is, as the name implies, this is for when you're actually pushing, not just grabbed or released, but when you've actually moved the object physically from one tile to another through the act of pushing it, okay? This returns four variables, okay? Self and initiator are the standard, same as they are with grabbed and released, but when you're pushing it, you get two extra variables. Dollar, previous tile, is the one that you were where the object has just been pushed from when you push it onto a new tile and target tile is the one where it's going to okay so if we apply and save that and we quick play we can see this in action so if i now go over to here grab and push there we go so we can see that the self was the barrel um, initiator is base Justin because that's who's grabbed the barrel. So the previous tile, the coordinates were minus two, minus two, and the target ta um, tile is minus one. So we can see we've moved it to the left or to the right. Sorry, we've moved it from minus two to minus one, and let's make let's move it to zero. There we go. So now it's its previous tile was minus one, and now its target tile is zero. So that's quite cool, useful information that you can actually use those two variables to keep track of where you've moved it from and where you're now moving it to. Again, you can store that in properties or you can check, you know, those inbuilt variables to, to, to check if it's a specific coordinate or a specific tile model. Again, you can use, if you know that um, this is a reference to a tile, we should be able to print, let's, let's try this. Instead of printing the previous tile, let's try doing previous tile dot model and see if that works. So that way you could check the model of a previous tile or you, or, or the target tile, or you can, check the coordinates there you go so path two just returns the model or you could just return the coordinates or you could return an id if the tile has an id anything you want um, but that those built-in variables can be really useful so that dollar previous tile and dollar target tile can be used when you're pushing um, an object so any script that you put on the globe on the object is pushed global event you can reference the previous tile 
and the target tile using these variables here. Okay, very handy. So moving on, let's get to the next one, which is tool item changes. Okay, so let's put the global script onto that. So tool item changes. This event basically gets fired whenever you equip a tool item. And just to be clear, tool items are basically um, items in your items editor that you've marked as being a tool item, i.e. this is turned on. Okay. For this, obviously, you also need to go into your game configuration and go to settings, user interface, and make sure your item UI is on so that you can actually equip your items properly. So we'll show that in game in a second. So what does the tool item event give us back that we can use in our scripts? Really, only one thing. And it's dollar item ID. Okay. So I'll apply and save that. So just for the purposes of demonstrating this, I've created a copy of my sword and set it instead to be a tool. And I've also made a copy of the apple just to set it as a tool as well. So that's item 004 and item 002. So if we quick play. And if I just give myself those two items. Two and four. We look in our inventory. I've got a sword tool and an apple tool, okay? So the tool um, icon is this hand here. This is not visible unless you are unless you enable it in the global, um, in the game configuration. This is the tool item UI, okay? So as soon as we click this, we equip the sword and we can see item 0002 gets logged in the top left corner because that's what dollar item ID returns. So whenever you change your tool item, it returns the ID of the item that is now equipped. So if I put the apple in there, we now get item 0004. If I switch it back to empty handed, we get null because obviously in the case of having nothing equipped, null would be nothing. So therefore the item ID is null. Okay, but every time you equip a new item, it replaces the item ID. Okay, so again, you can have any scripts in this event can check for the item ID, check if it's a specific item, and if so, do something or store that item in a property for later use. So that's that. So let's go back to our global events. So now we get on to the final three, which I'm basically going to cover uh, really only one of these. I'm going to cover the quest given. Completed and failed would be the exact same. Every time you fail a quest or every time you complete a quest, the event will fire, irrespective of what quest it is. It's just going to every time a quest is completed or every time a quest is failed, these um, two events will fire and any scripts you assign to those events, like every other thing we've covered in this list, you can have something happen in, the, in those situations. The reason, I'm, the reason I'm only going to cover one of these three is because very much like character enters and stops and exits a tile, they all share the same data. They all give back the same information, okay? And it's really only one piece of information, okay? So what I'm going to do to demonstrate this is I'm going to set the global script up on quest given, and I'm going to say none for the tool item. And to give you an idea of what you might use this for, just so we've got a practical example, I've created a widget uh, off screen called quest window. And I'm going to blank that out and save that. It shouldn't have been uh, populated. And I'm going to go to my quests. So this is one of the quests I've got. I'm just going to quickly add another one. I'm just going to call this um, the second quest, something like that, and we'll click save. So if I go to my script now, 
So log message. What does the quest uh, given, quest completed, and quest failed events give back as a data type? It gives back a local variable, quest underscore ID, which is going to be the ID of the quest. So in other words, it's going to give back this ID, depending on which was the quest that failed, or which was the quest that completed, or which was the quest that was given. Okay. So in this case, because we're putting this script on the quest given event, every time we're given a quest, we can grab what's the ID of the quest in this case that has triggered this event to fire. Okay. So in our script, what we're going to do, put it more practically, is, well, let, well let's just first of all be thorough and I'll just show what this returns. Okay. So if I bring down the console and type give quest quest 0001, we look in our log, it's given us quest 001. That's the dollar I, uh, quest ID. Okay. So here's what I want to do with my quest given script. I want to type widget and then get the ID for my widget, which is QW. So I go back to my script. So widget QW dot element. That's the text field or text label that I have on my widget dot text should equal quest. And then we're going to pass in the ID that we get given from the event dot name. So that should populate into that widget the title of the quest that we've been given. Okay. And then we'll show widget uh, QW and then we'll wait four seconds, let's say, and then we'll hide widget QW. So every time we get given a quest, this script is going to fire because it's going to go onto the global event of when we're given a quest. So every time we're given a quest, the first thing it does is it stores the name of that quest into the widget and it's going to show us the widget for four seconds and then hide it. So if we now play the game, Obviously, I'm going to be doing this via console commands, but obviously, if you had a, a moment in your game where you're given a quest, so let's say we give ourselves quest 001, and we should get our pop-up window, functions list quest, and that populates by the title of the quest. If I give myself the second quest, the second quest comes up as the title. Okay, so it's grabbing the title from the actual um, quests section here. It's populating these automatically. And obviously, if you wanted to grab the description, you could do that too. You would do it the same way, but you'd obviously have to have another text field on your widget, but you would just do quest and then in brackets, dollar quest ID dot description. And that would be the description text. If you wanted to show that as well, then you can have that happen as well. So every time you're given a quest, in this case, we're grabbing from the quest ID that it returns, we're grabbing then more information about it. We're grabbing the name specifically, storing that into our notification widget, and then showing that widget for four seconds and hiding it. And that happens automatically every time we get given a quest because it's on the global event when a quest is given. Okay, So we don't have to worry about which quest. It will always happen um, every time we're given a quest and it will automatically populate in this case by, by using that ID that it gives back, we can then grab the relevant quest information from that ID. Uh, the only other thing I want to do just to run it one more time, just cause I'm a slight perfectionist is make sure that the horizontal alignment is center. Just so it looks a bit nicer. 
if you want to embellish it a little bit, we could also go into our script and we could say, um, uh, let me think about how to do this, equals color, it needs to be in square brackets, color equals hashtag, uh, let's make it green, so 00FF00, zero, 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 and then plus quest, quest ID dot name, plus close out color. See if that works. So that should now give us green text for our widget. So if I give myself the quest one more time, There we go, functions of this quest. And now if I give myself quest two, the second quest. Okay, so that is in essence all of the global events currently as they are. Obviously, as of filming this, there are no uh, other ones at the moment, but if any get added, then I might revisit this video. But for now, I hope that's um, clear. So again, just to reiterate that quest completed and quest failed, they all both return dollar quest ID as well. So if you wanted something to happen every time you complete a quest, you would put that script on this event and you can use dollar quest underscore ID to check the ID of the quest that was just completed. And likewise with fail, if you put a script on that event, then every time a quest is failed, this event will fire. And then you can use a script on that event to, to check dollar quest underscore ID to see what was the ID of the quest that was just failed. So again, if you want something to happen every time a quest is completed, then you can ignore the quest ID. But if you want to check if a particular quest has been completed, then you can check um, the quest underscore ID to see if it matches the one you're particularly listening out for. So... That is all of the global events. Um, hopefully this has, you know, helped explain all of these different events, when they fire and what triggers them and what if, uh, data you can get back from each and how you might be able to use that data in your game designs. So if you have any questions, obviously feel free to ask on the Discord. Um, I will no doubt chat to this. So if you want to jump to a, partic a particular event, in this list to, to learn about it. It should be chaptered. Um, so feel free to do that as well. But with that said, that will wrap up this video. Thanks for watching.